Hello. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Shihoko Goto, the director of the newly established Indo-Pacific program here at the Wilson Center. Um, it's great to have you here with us today, wherever you may be logging in. Over the next hour, we'll be discussing prospects for a free and open economic order and visions for the global south. We'll be highlighting Japan, since Japan has played a pivotal role in bridging relations between East and West and between advanced economies and emerging markets over the decades. At the G7 Hiroshima summit last year, the world's leading industrial economies highlighted the need for greater cooperation and commitment to the global south, not just for altruistic reasons, but for geostrategic considerations as well. But the term global south casts a wide net across low and middle income countries worldwide with disparate needs and economic priorities. Can strategic investments and partnerships across South and Southeast Asia and beyond enhance support for the, rules, uh, for the rule of law in a rules-based economic order? These are, of course, big questions with no easy answers, but we are fortunate to be joined by those who should be able to give us a better perspective on these pressing issues. From Tokyo, we are honored to have Noriyuki Shikata, Cabinet Secretary for Public Affairs with the Prime Minister's Office of Japan. He is joined by Meredith Potter, Managing Director for Indo-Pacific Policy with the International Development Finance Corporation of the United States. And we're also excited to have Amar Malik, a Wilson Center China Fellow and Director of the Chinese Development Finance Program at William & Mary. Um, let me first turn to Nori. Um, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific um, vision has been a driving force in defining and shaping shared interests and concerns amongst like-minded countries across the region. Tokyo is now pressing for a free and open international order. How does this configure into Japan's broader outreach and expectations for the global south? Um, Nori, you are on mute, so we are going to have to ask you to start over. Yes, yes. Well, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Well, thank you very much uh, for your kind invitation, uh, Shoko-san. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me to join uh, your program from uh, Tokyo, with a newly established uh, Indo-Pacific uh, program. And uh, we think that this is very important program uh, in the context of a deepening our dialogue on the issues surrounding the Indo-Pacific. So today I wish to uh, discuss uh, Japanese perspectives uh, on the issues uh, of uh, uh, the Japan's view of free and open economic order and Japan visions for the global south. And if you could uh, go back uh, one page uh, before, uh, you may recall uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, giving uh, a talk at the sites, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, last year uh, in January. And the next page is a summary of uh, his uh, speech at SAIS. And of course, you know, he started to discuss uh, the importance of uh, preserving free and free, open, and stable international order, uh, which is now in grave danger. And uh, it is uh, important to strengthen the Japan-US relationship. And as uh, you are aware, Prime Minister Kishida has been shifting uh, Japan's policy toward Russia in response to its aggression against Ukraine and the shift in security policy, as well as demonstrated by uh, his uh, new national security strategy. And he touched upon three issues. One is strengthening uh, the unity of like-minded countries, especially the G7, and strengthening relations with those referred to as the global south. So today's uh, talks, focus on this issue of the global, global South. And uh, 
if you move on to the next uh, uh, slide, uh, which he mentioned uh, in the context of uh, Japan's engagement with the Global South. Uh, Japan has been working on uh, global issues uh, such as energy, food, climate change, and health. And it is uh, becoming increasingly important to have a balance of having a voice and bearing responsibility on the, on the side of Global South. And uh, for Japan, Southeast Asian countries or ASEAN are very important partners in this context of uh, free and open the Pacific. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida was hosting ASEAN leaders uh, at the end of last year. And we are also engaging proactively with India in the context of uh, Japan-India special strategic global partnership. Of course, you know, there are other South, uh, uh, global South countries, uh, including Africa, Middle East, Latin America, and, and others. Next uh, slide uh, depicts Japan's basic view of uh, a free and open in the Pacific, connecting the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And we, we wish to make sure that uh, these uh, oceans and the two continents would be connected based on the rule of law. And um, uh, in this connection, we wish to further strengthen connectivity across ASEAN region, South Asia, uh, and other uh, regions, including even as far as to East Africa. So next uh, slide is uh, focusing on ASEAN connectivity. As uh, you may know, you know, Japan has been working on uh, uh, improving transportation connectivities, including urban connectivities and some uh, cross-border connectivities, transportation. But Prime Minister Kishida announced his intention to be more comprehensive, to cover maritime cooperation, supply chain, power connectivity, digital, among others. So these are some of the examples of uh, uh, the projects that Japan have been promoting in uh, Southeast Asia. Next slide is uh, uh, the connectivity projects, connecting uh, Northeast India and Bangladesh. And this is a new project, a policy initiative announced by Prime Minister Kishida and we are talking about connecting Northeast India and Bangladesh, which would, would be eventually be connected with Southeast Asia. And so these are the, some of the projects uh, that we have been pro uh, promoting. And the next slide is another uh, dimension in the context of uh, promoting uh, the concept of uh, Asia Zero Emission Community. And, uh, we have been working uh, individually with the uh, uh, respective Southeast Asian countries, as, as well as Australia, in promoting green transition or green transformation. So uh, next slide uh, illustrates some of the examples of uh, Japan's engagement in different uh, uh, countries in ASEAN. We call it ASEC, Asia Zero uh, Emission Community. And this is in uh, collaboration with the private sector. And in promoting these projects, we make sure that uh, we stick to the principles, such as uh, transparency of projects, openness, openness in the context of collab collaboration with other players, and economic viability and fiscal uh, sustainability. And we wish to avoid uh, creating any issues associated with so-called uh, debt trap. So I just uh, stop here as an initial uh, uh, remarks of mine. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, comprehensive view, not just of the free and open Indo-Pacific um, vision that uh, Japan has really spearheaded, but also focusing on some of the projects. I think it's interesting um, that you highlighted the Bangladesh 
um, India investment. I am very well aware that India, uh, Bangladesh has become a, very much a source of um, great Japanese investment and, and interest as well. So I'm sure we can discuss this further um, as we uh, go through um, our conversation. But before um, we we delve further into what you address, Nori, I'd like to turn now to um, Meredith um, and perhaps discuss uh, some of the shared interests and also potential uh, you know differences between the U.S. and Japanese approach to uh, the global South. So uh, let me. Well, thank you, um, Shiroko, and thank you to the Wilson Center. It's always um, both a pleasure and I think a strategic opportunity to dialogue with you all about this region. Um, if you don't mind going back a slide, um, I'll just say very briefly, by way of introduction, um, my name is Meredith Potter. I work at the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC which is a rather new agency. We were created by um, an act of Congress um, uh, in 2019, opened our doors uh, uh, around that time, had to figure out how to make a difference, um, by and large locked in our homes at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, but have found throughout um, Japan to be one of our closest and most reliable partners. Um, if we'll go to the next slide, I will definitely say a little bit about what we do. Um, spoiler, we finance private sector investment and development and believe that private sector investment, both locally and foreign direct investment is a key um, to the prosperity, the stability, the openness of the Indo-Pacific. And we appreciate um, that Japan agrees with those sentiments. But I thought I would copy my Japanese colleague and before I talk about what we do, before I get specific about private sector investment, I might back up, zoom out, and talk about the United States government's concept um, of what prosperity and freedom uh, looks like in the Indo-Pacific. So you have here on this slide the five tenets of the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, um, many of which uh, can be advanced by uh, private sector investment in the countries and the region. The first, of course, and most fundamental is that the region would be and would remain free and open. Um, in this sense, I think those financiers among us make our contributions by financing transparently, by incentivizing that, um, certainly by advancing common approaches to critical and emerging technologies, including the internet. So when we think about what it looks like for the US and Japan to work together on some of the connectivity projects, some of the digital infrastructure projects you've already heard about during this hour um, from uh, the government of Japan, um, we, are certainly, we certainly have um, the internet top of mind. The second tenet of the Biden administration's strategy toward the region is that the region would be connected um, that we would focus on deepening our relationships with our five treaty allies in the region, which of course includes Japan, that we would focus on strengthening the Quad, which of course includes Japan. Um, I think a, a familiar refrain uh, you'll hear uh, from me as the representative this hour of the US government, um, that we would look to strengthen relationships with leading regional partners, um, top of mind for us, particularly when it comes to mobilizing private capital is India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Pacific Islands. Um, another sentiment with which we, we share with Japan, you've already heard um, about wanting to connect India, for example, to some of its neighbors. Um, and of course, empowering ASEAN, another shared sentiment. 
Three, that the region would be prosperous. Um, we're looking to do our part to achieve that prosperity by investing in infrastructure, especially through the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, which because it's a G7 wide initiative, um, sees us working together with Japanese colleagues quite often to meet infrastructure needs in the global south. Of course, um, we want it to be characterized by meeting high standards throughout and doing what we can by meeting high standards to incentivize everyone <laughs> to meet those standards, right? To create infrastructure that's sustainable, including by local populations. Um, and then of course, um, that we would advance um, resilient and as a result, secure supply chains, supply chains that are diverse, open and predictable. Fourth, uh, the fourth tenant is that the region would be secure um, I think those of us who work in mobil the mobilization of private finance maybe have less to do with this tenant than some of our colleagues in the defense space, but it should be said um, that a, a, a core tenant of the way we think about defense these days um, on the US government side is in terms of integrated deterrence, in terms of mobilizing the full suite of all of our tools, of all of the tools of our allies and combining them, bringing them to bear by combining them. So we do have a role to play there. And fifth and finally, our vision for the region is that it would be resilient to climate change, to pandemics, to malicious actions, such as invasions that cause among other things, food insecurity the world over. Um, if we'll go to the next slide, that's where the Development Finance Corporation and our work with Japanese um, colleagues and friends comes into play. Um, we are the US government's development finance institution. When we speak with developing economies, they are very clear with us um, uh, that what will keep them free and open, that what will make them prosperous is foreign direct investment, is the growth of their economies, is the increasing of their resilience, they want things like infrastructure, green energy, and technology of the future. But they also have learned quite a few lessons, particularly in the last decade or so. Um, they are equally clear um, about in terms of uh, about what they want. They are equally clear about how they want it. They care about how we work. Um, they want alternatives to opaque lending, poor construction, disregard for standards that do things like protect workers, communities, the environment. Um, and they want alternatives to sovereign debt. They simply cannot sustain. Um, I would say above all, they want partnership that is responsive to their priorities and their local conditions. So here at DFC, we work to meet those needs, as I said, by financing private sector investment um, that in terms of values um, reflects ours, opportunities that are market driven, financing that is transparent, telecommunications that are open and secure, energy that's sustainable, projects that meet international standards, um, and billions of de dollars dedicated not to those things, um, but actually to investing in small businesses. In other words, in entrepreneurship, um, in innovation, and in what we believe grows and sustains economies. And then second, in terms of financing, we do all of that um, by putting debt and risk um, on companies rather than on sovereign governments, especially sovereign governments that are maybe already in debt distress due to predatory lending. Um, that has the effect of seeing uh, those companies align the projects with market incentives, which radically increases the probability that the projects will succeed. Next slide. Um, just some visuals for you all. What we offer in terms of the full suite of our tools, um, debt financing, equity investments, investments in funds that on invest, um, uh, my answer to the first question you have posed, Shihoko, um, sort of what's the same between the U.S. and Japan and what's different um, is that the vision is the same. That's why it was important to me to start um, with our Indo-Pacific strategy um, so it can be heard by the attendees today just how similar it is to Japan's vision for the region and for economic prosperity. What's slightly different is our tools, um, which means that the onus is on us to educate ourselves about the difference in, differences in those tools and to work together to sort of creatively in each situation when presented with each project, decide who the best meter of the need is, uh, including if the best meter of the need is a combination of our tools, is us working together. Next slide. And just to hammer home the point, um, what we value, um, this is actually the slide we show every single prospective private sector company with whom we work. Um, and I think it's a helpful illustration 
uh, in hammering home the point of how much we agree with our Japanese colleagues and friends, um, upholding high standards, meaningfully responding to the needs of the country in question, treating them as a partner, et cetera. Next slide. I wanted to be sure um, to get to sort of what we're all here to discuss today, um, which is in the case of the Development Finance Corporation, how we work with Japan. Um, I'm thrilled to report that how we work with Japan is in many ways um, across many sectors um, and in the form of many partnerships. Our primary partner in the government of Japan is the Japan Bay for International, of International Cooperation, JBEC, with whom we cooperate actually bilaterally, trilaterally with multiple partners and quadrilaterally in the context of the quad. I'll say a little bit more about a project that we did um, both with JBIC and our Australian um, colleagues and friends in the Pacific Islands, a digital connectivity project, because I completely agree with opening remarks about particular investments, particular projects, helping clarify, make concrete, um, some of the work we do. But I should mention that when it comes to the Quad, um, DFC, JBIC, uh, and, and um, our friends in Australia and India, um, were really one of the driving forces in terms of COVID response when we invented vaccines um, and needed to ramp up production of them. Um, we all gave to this Indian company, Biological E, um, that produced uh, vaccines in India was able to keep some in India, was able to export some. And every single member of the quad leveraged a different tool to do their part. Um, for DFC's part, we gave debt financing. Um, but for ex example, JVIC provided CapEx financing for day-to-day -day operations. Australia provided assistance for last mile delivery. It was a real example of working together. I should mention, we also have a fantastic relationship with JICA, though I think JICA would say that their primary partner in the US government is USAID. And I've just listed here on this slide some of what we've done together. I'll, I'll speak about a recent project in Vietnam, an on-lending project to TP Bank, just as an example. Um, and we are excited to be developing nascent relationships. Um, with JICT and with Nexi, with whom we have a formal MOU. So the fundamental answer is that um, our cooperation with Japan is vast because our vision of the world is the same. Next slide, I'll just conclude my remarks by offering two uh, examples in the interest of making some of our historic cooperation concrete. Um, first, I wanted to be sure to talk about a project called Telstra. That's the name of the private sector company. Um, in 2022 and into 2023, in support of the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, we cooperated both with JBIC in Japan and with um, Export Finance Australia to support an Australian telecom company, Telstra, um, acquisition of Digicel Pacific's telecom network and assets. The other bidder um, for the network and the assets um, was a strategic competitor sort of SOE, a government-backed SOE. Um, and uh, we in Japan and Australia were concerned um, that if the right company didn't buy this network, um, one, perhaps there would be an interruption in the service, the mobile service um, provided by the network, and two, long-term, perhaps there would be a compromising of cybersecurity, data privacy, other principles that we and Japanese colleagues and friends hold so dear. So each one of us, again, brought a different tool to bear in our and JBIC's case, loan guarantees and an EFA's actual lending to the company. It was a fantastic um, example of what we can do when we put our heads together. Uh, and then finally, next slide, um, uh, in a nod to JICA uh, rather than JPEC, I wanted to mention um, that um, we very recently celebrated um, just, we both gave loans, right, on lending uh, to a Vietnamese bank, TP Bank. Uh, we gave $100 million and JICA gave $100 million. And TP Bank is going to use that $200 million to massively expand its digital financing. Digital financing being a fantastic way to increase inclusion in the financial sector, to reach small businesses, rural businesses um, that, unless they can put their financing online, are reticent to put their business online. Um, so I will stop there. Um, I could speak all day about um, the many ways in which we cooperated with Japanese friends and partners, but I will stop there. Uh, thank, thank you, Meredith. You, you covered a lot of ground. Thank you very much for the overview. And um, I'm hoping we can also talk a little bit about the specifics about the Pacific Islands and some of the other uh, areas that you, you mentioned. But let me first turn to Amar. Um, we have not actually talked 
yet about China. And of course, um, we're all familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative. We know about the Chinese capital uh, financing across the global <clears throat> south. We know about the allure and also the pitfall of Chinese financing. We also have heard about the potential shifts in um, China's target regions and, and industries when it comes to development. But we have a lot of information and I think also a lot of preconceived notions. I'm hoping you could um, set us straight and enlighten us about the future of Chinese investments, um, especially in infrastructure based on concrete information and data. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... Shihoko. Um, so um, I will talk a little bit about uh, some findings from a recent report that we have done at ADATA. As many of you may know in the audience, ADATA maintains uh, what I think is arguably the, the world's largest and most comprehensive and granular data set on Chinese development finance. And we do this because uh, unlike some of the other uh, traditional donors, both bilateral and multilateral, China does not share the details of its uh, development financing program, both aid and credit in any systematic way uh, in any international aid transparency initiative. So we're in the business of filling that gap and I hope to set, shed some light on the emerging global picture. And of course we can dig deep into some of the specific countries. So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I wanna show you, talk about three things. First is what is actually the true scale scope uh, and um, uh, you know size of Chinese development finance uh, in the world. Second, if you are uh, looking at the Belt and Road Initiative uh, from a Chinese perspective, what does the world look like? How have projects performed? And the third thing is what has been the response from the Chinese side and what are some of the new realities with which we have to grapple with as we think of this broader region and indeed the entire world. So the first question we set to ask ourselves when we collected this entire data set, uh, which, by the way, is freely available on our website, uh, adata.org, and you can also interact with the data at china.adata.org if you want to go into specifics. But the first question was, is China still the single largest provider or of, of official source of aid and credit to the, to the developing world? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so if you look at the first eight years of the BRI era from 2014 to 2021, you can see uh, on the top chart that China has committed $680, uh, $680 billion, which is more than twice what the United States had committed. Um, and uh, Japan comes at uh, number four. Um, Chinese development finance is hovering at around $80 billion per year. And we expect that that is going to remain the same at the, for the time being. The other thing that is important to remember is the color of the money. So you'll see a lot more yellow in the China bar as compared to some of the others. Uh, yellow indicates OOF, what we call other official flows, and the blue indicates ODA, or short for aid. ODA consists of grants, but also highly concessional loans or 0% interest rate loans. Uh, China is uh, far ahead of the game as far as loans are concerned, uh, and these loans come from official sectors, including China's vast uh, state-owned commercial bank system, their state-owned enterprises. All of that is considered to be official finance, and that's really how China is performing uh, in this big way and delivering in this big way. If you actually look at just China's aid portfolio, it's hovering at around $5 billion, which makes, makes it a mid-size ODA provider like uh, Denmark uh, or, or a country of that size. The other thing that I think is quite important and interesting is to think about the trajectory. Um, as you know, there's a lot of conversation around the BRI slowing down, the effects of the Chinese economy. Of course, we are only looking at data until 2021, but it does capture some of the uh, some of the COVID years. So you did see that the peak of Chinese development finance, actually, if you, if you look at the bottom chart, came uh, not during the BRI era. In fact, the biggest year on year increases came prior to the BRI uh, in the year 2009 and 10. And this is because uh, at the time, uh, we had the great financial crisis in the world and the U.S. Fed reduced uh, benchmark interest rates down where Chinese banks were forced to withdraw a lot of the uh, the dollars and the treasury bills that they were holding and they went looking for bankable projects. So that tells you a little bit about the sort of commercial orientation or profit-seeking orientation of Chinese development finance. And then, of course, we saw a gradual decline in year-on-year -year commitments since the peak of 2017-2016. Uh, and then there's been a gradual uptick 
since 2021. Um, so with that in mind, um, the question is, how has the risk portfolio changed in China's international development finance portfolio? And I always like to talk about if you were in uh, Beijing and you're looking at a dashboard of all the world's projects on the Belt and Road, you will see a lot of flashing red lights. And I say this because there's three big risks that um, China is facing. First risk that they're facing on the BRI is around the repayment. So there was this time period during the early years of the BRI when a lot of development finance activity took place. A lot of countries received big projects, but now it's payback time because a lot of these big infrastructure projects are due for generating the returns on the basis of which the loans were giving out in the first place. So 55% of the loan portfolio is now due for repayment. Not only that, but 80% of the global portfolio is in countries which are either in de debt distress or are uh, about to uh, reach that debt distress level, according to the IMF. So basically, if you're China, you're essentially looking at a $1 trillion uh, uh, debt collection effort because the total scale of Chinese development finance that we have measured at aid data is around $1.4 trillion. So it's a big repayment risk that they're facing. Second risk that they're facing is around the performance of this loan portfolio. So if you go back 20 years or so in the year 2000 uh, and looked at problem projects, problems uh, such as environmental or social issues, governance or corruption issues, there were only 17 projects worth $450 million in the BRI or the Chinese development finance that faced problems. And now if you fast forward it to today, we are counting 1,700 projects worth $450 billion with a B having E, S, or G problem, environmental, social, or governance problem. And so the proportion of projects that are suffering from these problems, as you can see in the line, has gone up quite dramatically. It's gone up from 12% to 53%. And also cancellations and suspensions have been on the rise. Um, and the third risk that China is also facing again, this is data up until 2021, is on the reputational side. As you all know, this is a lot of this is about public diplomacy. It's about soft power. And if you look at public opinion polling data in the countries that have received data, we, look, we rely on Gallup World Poll data. From um, 2019 to 2021, just in that three-year period, the average favorability for Chinese leadership as compared to the U.S. leadership has been going down, as you can see in these charts. Um, this is all uh, China vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. So it's gone average in absolute term has gone from 56 to 40 uh, percent. China has lost more on both media sentiment, which is how the media in local countries talks about China. And it has also lost on elite engagement, which is U.N. General Assembly voting. Um, and uh, Quickly, I will talk a little bit about what are the policy implications. I think the first thing to remember is we need to update our assumptions about what BRI is. We should not rely on BRI 1.0 error assumptions to study BRI 2.0. Uh, as I said, there was three risks. So what are the Chinese doing about it? It's quite actually quite interesting. So first thing that the Chinese have started doing is they have been ramping down infrastructure lending and ramping up rescue lending. And by rescue lending, I mean short-term liquidity injections, such as deposits or uh, renminbi denominated uh, debt swaps, especially to large countries such as Argentina, Pakistan, and others, which took really large size development loans. So uh, essentially, they are betting on the solvency of these countries and making an assumption that these countries are only facing a short-term liquidity challenge. And of course, we can debate that discussion as to when this will happen. And what's happened is that if you're just looking at China Exim Bank and China Development Bank, which are the two big policy banks, it looks like Chinese development finance is coming down. Their role is coming down. And what is actually happening more and more of is there has been a rise, a steady rise in syndicated lending. Uh, and when I say syndicated lending, these are large consortium of banks, Chinese banks and non-Chinese banks that come together to provide development finance. In fact, half of all new loans that China gave out in the year 2021 came through this channel. And 80% of this was with non-Chinese lenders. So Meredith was talking about private uh, partnerships and getting private capital. I think what we are seeing here is that the Chinese have been uh, able to use that quite effectively. And as a result of that, they're also using collateral. And unlike, uh, and 72% of the portfolio now uh, uses collateral. Um, and unlike what we might think uh, as like uh, a typical Chinese collateral, which is a port or uh, illiquid assets, the Chinese actually like to collateralize on cash. We have found evidence that they use escrow account agreements 
to uh, have the borrowers hold five to ten percent of the loan value of the loan um, to be in an escrow account, which they could debit at a moment's notice. Uh, escrow accounts are essentially lender controlled bank accounts that are like a guarantee in case you are not able to repay a loan. So that is really the big change that's happening. Another big change that the Chinese have taken place is that at least as far as the terms and conditions of the loan agreements are concerned, we at data are finding a, a, a pretty sizable improvement in uh, ESG safeguards, at least in the contracts. So as you can see in the in the blue color uh, uh, in in my chart, um, the proportion of projects that are uh, that could be considered strong ESG safeguards uh, as compared to the gold standard, which is the World Bank and IFC's environmental and social standards, they have made a major improvement and have been improving this. This is on the back of a lot of guidelines that the Chinese state has been giving out since 2018 on greening the BRI, and so we're beginning to see an effect of that. However, we are not seeing any impact on the speed at which China is able to deliver these projects, which by the way is a major advantage they have. On average, a Chinese development finance project as far as infrastructure is concerned is delivered within three years. And you know that uh, as compared to that in the World Bank, uh, highest standard project takes six years just to take it to the board, just to start the project, let not even finish the project. So I think that this is a pretty major wake up call for the G7 since uh, Chinese always have had the advantage of speed and, uh, speed and scale. Uh, quality was never their strong suite, and there's some at least early evidence that they're improving on quality, at least as far as contracts are concerned. Last thing I'll say is that what are they doing on the soft power side of things? So first thing you have to remember is if you divide the Belt and Road portfolio in, in four or three uh, sections, we, divide, we looked at public opinion, media sentiment, and elite alignment during the Belt and Road era, and we divided the world into four parts. So countries which are safe bets for China, countries which are moonshots, which means they're more on the US or Western side, uh, countries which are toss up in the middle. What we find is that two thirds of all Chinese development finance in the last four years that we measured in the BRI era, two thirds of it is going into the toss up countries. So whether or not you believe that China has a strategy, it's clear that they're putting more money where they think there is competition and less money where they think the countries are in the moonshot category. There was some conversation about Bangladesh and I agree Bangladesh is really important. It's a quite an interesting example and an illustration of how China operates. I have seen evidence that when things are going well, in other words, when China finds a like-minded development oriented a centralized power holding leader like Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh, they really double down on big ticket infrastructure as far as loans are concerned. So if you compare the eras of Khalid Azia or the military years uh, in Bangladesh in the early 2000s, uh, large proportions of these projects were in the form of uh, ODA or aid. Now ODA has come down uh, and total size of lending has gone up to over $2 billion. And as Sheikh Hasina has uh, made, uh, you know, made her rule in Bangladesh more and more, uh, I wouldn't say autocratic, maybe less democratic in her orientation, the size and scale and speed with which Chinese operators coming and scooping in all the big ticket infrastructure projects, including, by the way, many projects with JICA had conceived years ago, and now they're coming and building those out, that has gone up. So the lesson that I'm taking away from this is that when China uh, benefits from tailwinds, they double down. And when they face headwinds like they do, did in Zambia, when Edward Lungu went away and Zambia eventually defaulted, they go the opposite strategy. They lay low and they let things pass. So I'll stop here and I hope that uh, we get some good discussion moving forward. Thank you. No, that was great. Thank you so much for providing us with a lot of information to, to chew on. And yes, BRI 1.0 versus 2.0, that's, that's something that we do. Um, I have to bear in mind. Um, I was remiss. Um, for those who are listening to us live, we are taking questions. Uh, you can either email us on our new email address, which is Indo-Pacific at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's um, Indo-Pacific at wilsoncenter.org. Um, you can all also tweet us or reach us on X, um, which is WC underscore Indo-Pacific. Again, on Twitter, um, it's WC underscore uh, Indo-Pacific. So um, we would really like your um, questions and comments and, and uh, feedback. So let me turn first to Nori. Um, Prime Minister Kishida, 
will be here in Washington next month. You started your discussion with um, his comments at SICE. How is um, this idea of the Global South going to be addressed, if at all, uh, between President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida? And what kind of concrete um, developments can we actually see from the two sides moving forward? Well, thank you. Um, as uh, we have already announced, uh, uh, there will be not only bilateral between uh, Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden, but uh, President Marcos of the Philippines uh, will come on board. So we'll be having trilateral or minilateral among uh, the United States, Japan, and the Philippines. So this is something which is uh, unprecedented. And um, in light of uh, a very challenging uh, geopolitical landscape uh, surrounding the Philippines, especially uh, in South China Sea, it is uh, very important uh, for us uh, to preserve uh, the rule of law and uh, peace and uh, prosperity uh, in the region. So uh, this is uh, one example of uh, how we are collaborating between the United States and Japan engaging with a third country. Of course, uh, last year's uh, Camp David summit uh, engaging uh, uh, President Yoon of uh, South Korea uh, has a different nature, but we need to be attentive uh, to South Korea's uh, emerging foreign policy uh, to engage uh, with the Indo-Pacific region. So uh, there are uh, multiple uh, those minilaterals, including uh, the Quad, in, uh, engaging with uh, uh, Australia and India uh, among uh, the US and Japan. So uh, this is uh, uh, some of those uh, concrete efforts to promote uh, cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. And when it comes to the, the actual projects, uh, as was already mentioned by Meredith, uh, that there has been uh, increasing, emerging cooperation uh, with the US government and the Japanese government in close collaboration with the private sector. Uh, those uh, projects are, are making progress across the Indo-Pacific region and uh, countries like uh, Australia are also coming on board on these uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to repeat, we are taking questions. Again, email us, um, indopacific at wilsoncenter.org or um, tweet us, WC underscore Indo-Pacific. Um, Meredith, one of the interesting, th Amar covered a lot of ground, but one of the things that really struck me was this whole idea of moonshot countries versus um, the um, sway of old countries, toss up countries. Um, does the United States, um, how, how would the United States categorize toss up countries? For instance, I would say, you know, uh, the South Pacific, Indo um, Pacific Island nations would fall into that category. China may say that they are actually firmly on their side. Uh, what is the strategy to reach out to some of the toss up and moonshot countries? You know, I actually think um, we would not categorize countries that way. Um, we would be deliberate. We might use a, you know, a, a big black marker <laughs> to write um, that countries are not up for grabs. Um, countries are partners. Um, we are looking for partners that want to work with us, with Japan, with Australia, um, with the Republic of Korea, I'm trying to go through Nori's list, um, to chart their own economic futures. And if we didn't believe that countries should be in the driver's seat, if we didn't believe they know their local conditions and priorities best, um, then we wouldn't care at all about mobilizing private sector investment that at the end of the day doesn't report <laughs> to the US government um, into their countries. Um, so I think we are constantly looking to hear uh, what they need. Um, Amar has made 
an important point that part of asking countries what they need, what their vision for themselves is, is on what timeline, <laughs> how quickly do they need those things? Um, you know, we live in the world and most democratically ele elected leaders serve um, 10 years. So a president who's in office for eight years, 10 years, 12 years is gonna have a vision for the economic development of their country. Um, and we seek to be responsible, re responsive to that. Um, when it comes to um, making ourselves available to the entire global South, um, an institution like DFC, I think still needs to ramp up just our people capacity. Um, as I said, we're you know somewhere between four and five years old. Um, we've actually doubled in size uh, since I started here about a year ago. Um, and we're continuing to ramp up, particularly putting folks who specialize in business development and having early conversations with the private sector in countries rather than in Washington. So we have a long way to go, but um, I stand by the marker that would say um, countries are partners, um, um, no, no one is up for grabs. If I can just follow up on that. So um, we've heard Bangladesh mentioned a couple of times. Sheikh Hashina um, is a strong leader, um, to put it politely. Um, as the United States focuses on good governance, what is the U.S. position in providing, um, encouraging the flow of private capital to countries like Bangladesh, which is on an upward trajectory, but also may not necessarily align um, with some of the governance values that the United States has? Yeah, it's a great question with the important caveat um, for, for the stakeholders that are listening who will, will chuckle when I make this caveat. Um, with the important caveat that DFC is actually closed in Bangladesh and it has to do with very technical, very boring internal US government regulation um, that we have to be the taker of determinations by our trade representative about at a national level, what countries are taking steps to improve workers' rights and what countries aren't. Um, so we're closed in Bangladesh, but there is a more fundamental point here um, in your question. Um, by crowding in private sector capital in every country in which we work, and in the last fiscal year, we did projects in more than hundred countries. So um, in every country in which we can work, um, working project by project, company by company to make a difference actually tees us up quite nicely to sort of function as a subnational rewarder of good behavior. We only finance companies that meet environmental standards, social standards. Um, we only finance companies that we can prove by running the numbers are gonna have a particular development impact on the local population. Either they're gonna create jobs um, or that you're gonna create economic growth um, or something like that. Um, so we have a bit more flexibility actually than some of our peers um, in the US government with whom we work closely. USAID deals directly with governments most of the time. So um, when they have challenges of corruption, when they need to start from a place of capacity building, that affects the way they disperse their money, the way they prioritize that disbursement. When you work with the private sector and you demand that they meet standards, um, both when it comes, as I said, to sort of ESG standards, but also on the financial side, when you demand transparency, when you demand information about the way they run their company, the way they're going to pay back, for example, the loan you're giving them, um, then you can function project by project by project um, as this subnational rewarder of good behavior. Thank you. So, Amar, you you come. You provided us with a great a great amount of data, but one of the things that I did want to follow up on was about syndicated loans and the rise of the increase in non Chinese partners. Um, I am hoping you might be able to elaborate a little bit on that and why, which countries and which um, sectors in particular there might be more of that non Chinese partnership um, emerging. Um, so, yeah, so first of all, I should say syndicated loan or syndicated lending is not a Chinese invention. Um, syndicated loans, I mean, in fact, the hub of all of this deal making is uh, is cities like London and New York, where some of the big banks come in. And being a former banker myself, I know that, you know, money follows wherever the returns are. So capitalists are doing what they do best, which is look for returns. So I think what China is doing is basically preparing projects 
and um, creating the impression or the conditions under which these big banks, I'm thinking HSBC, Citibank, it's, it's others, we have seen are some of the biggest operators. And they are also doing a lot of uh, brokerage on the ground. So in the early days of the BRI, what I mean by brokerage is, you know, back like Standard Chartered has been in Africa, in South Asia for 150, 160 years. And they know the conditions, they know the markets. And China was, is a relatively young player in this market. So they actually partnered with China to uh, make openings uh, in, at the, in, in the initial years and now, um, when I talk to bankers in Wall Street, they're having a lot of hard time competing with Chinese development finance because they tell me that they are able to now, China's Chinese banks are now able to access financing at very, very low rates, uh, whereas interest rates in the rest of the world are pretty high. I mean, benchmark interest rates and bills are pretty high in the US right now. So they feel that the hand of the Chinese state is creating conditions that make it incredibly difficult for Wall Street to compete with them. Uh, but I must say that this is, again, it's a free market, uh, private enterprise. Uh, you should check out the website. Uh, HSBC has a, has a website for uh, Belt and Road projects, and they're just doing what bankers are supposed to do, which is look for bankable projects with good returns. Uh, I think ch from China's perspective, it is really helpful in addressing some of the ESG concerns that I mentioned. Um, they have uh, adopted syndication almost as a shortcut way of improving the quality of their projects. So if you're, again, going back to the dashboard, if you're looking at a dashboard full of flashing red lights, you can either go back to these big bureaucratic institutions like China Exim Bank or China Development Bank and try to reform them and teach them how to do ESG properly. Or you can do a shortcut way, which is to create a syndicate. And uh, in the syndicate, you make a lead arranger, a company that takes the lead in arranging all the technical requirements. And if you choose a, a lead arranger, which is a big Western private bank or the IFC here in Washington, they will ensure that the highest quality standards are met and the Chinese bank just becomes a junior partner to them. And it's in a way, it's a shortcut uh, way of like getting higher quality projects out. And that's beginning to have an effect as I explained. Um, we've received a number of questions, a couple of questions about um, soft power. Um, and I'm hoping, Nodi, you might be able to elaborate a little bit more about um, how Japan's reputation uh, has increased, decreased, or remained um, constant as it focuses on quality infrastructure development and um, what the challenges are for Japan moving forward, especially as it um, loses in terms of actual volume um, investments in Southeast Asia. Well, as uh, I explained uh, uh, in the map of uh, uh, some of the projects that we have been promoting uh, in uh, across ASEAN countries or South Asia, I think we find lots of uh, uh, good quality infrastructure uh, under operation. And uh, as a matter of examples, uh, Japan has been very competitive in uh, subways or metro, Manila Metro, Delhi Metro, and the most uh, recent one is uh, Dhaka Metro in Bangladesh. And uh, when we talk about connectivity, we wish to connect uh, big cities, mega cities, for example, in India. And Prime Minister Modi has uh, requested uh, late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to build a high-speed rail or Shinkansen uh, across India. And that's something we have been uh, working on. And uh, uh, this is, uh, from our viewpoint, good quality infrastructure, which will also be conducive to addressing climate change issues. So we, we have been realistic about energy transition, green transition of uh, uh, those countries, which are in the process of uh, economic growth. So how could we support individual countries' uh, roadmap for green transformation is something we have been working individually, bilaterally, uh, with uh, ASEAN countries or India uh, and others. So we think that uh, as uh, we have contributed uh, to sustainable 
uh, economic growth of uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, we think that, that this kind of good practices could be recognized uh, by other countries in, the, uh, in other regions, such as in Africa. And uh, uh, good news is that uh, nowadays, uh, the, the Japanese startup companies are also going to Africa or Middle East. And that's where, uh, where we could uh, collaborate with other uh, like-minded countries, uh, businesses. And uh, I should add that the Japanese startup companies uh, are uh, committing uh, themselves to recovery and uh, rebuilding of Ukraine. Thank you. So Japan, there's there's more dynamism. There's more a, a, a more diverse portfolio, moving not playing to its strengths of infrastructure, but also in terms of startups as well. What about the reverse, uh, Meredith? The United States strength is startups. Strength is. Um, in areas that are not necessarily in mega infrastructure projects. Are we going to see a return, an appetite amongst the US companies to actually get involved in infrastructure like ports um, moving forward? Yeah, it's a, it's a great answer from Nori because it allows me, first of all, to put a fine point on my, my earlier comments um, about our vision being very similar and sometimes our tools being different. Um, JBIC in particular's ability to invest in startups, which is the result of JBIC recently amending its internal um, or the way it govern it, governs itself. Um, it's something that we here at DFC envy. Um, it's very difficult for us, uh, for example, to be a Series A investor in a startup. Um, and that's because we have different requirements when it comes to sourcing commercially viable transactions. Um, we tend to be able to prove that later in the process. So when a startup with a good idea needs financing, um, sometimes the, the allied solution or the G7 solution um, is to feel the JBIC rather than a DFC. And, and we have some humility about that and gratitude um, to JBIC for, for the difference in, in our authorities. Um, when it comes to what we do contribute and the way that it affects our reputation and our soft power, I will just repeat something else I said earlier, which is that DFC is committed, has invested billions of dollars in small business. And I think in stark contrast to the Belt and Road, to some of the other lending um, that the PRC has done, even if it's focusing on less big, in big infrastructure, it's, it's now coming to focus on sort of small but beautiful, still tangible pro projects. Um, it's a very sort of Western idea um, that the driver of an economy is small business, um, is entrepreneurship, is innovation. And it's one of the five uh, priority sectors on DFC's website. You can go, you can consume public information about the things we prioritize. Just one of them is infrastructure and one of them is small business. Um, so we're trying to be dynamic and responsive um, in not only meeting the needs of partner countries, but um, in advancing our values by meeting by meeting those needs and, and support for small business. Um, and in, in the case of a JBIC, um, all the way up to startups is certainly part of that. It's a little difficult for me to answer the, the crux of your question about US private sector appetite for investment in um, big infrastructure like ports. And that's actually because DFC um, does not have a US nexus. This is something our Japanese friends envy about our tools. Um, we can finance an Indian company, for example, if they wanna build a port in Sri Lanka in order to increase uh, transshipment to their own country, for example, but with developmental um, benefits for Sri Lanka. Um, so we're actually looking at the private sector worldwide. And when it comes to the private sector worldwide, I would say there's continued appetite um, for large scale long-term infrastructure projects, particularly working with a financer like DFC, our loan tenors are really long. There are things we can do to mitigate the risk of such a project. So across the whole world, we do see continued appetite. Thank you. So we have a minute left, oh, um, very quickly. Chinese economic slowdown. We've also seen uh, not a lot of return in terms of soft power. Um, uh, for China, um, how is this going to impact BRI 
Uh, I think, first of all, the, the main driver, in my view, of Chinese overseas development financing, as I had explained in, the, in my presentation, is not so much GDP growth in China. It is more the mountain of foreign reserves that China sits on top of. In fact, the most important player, in my view now, is the State Agency for Foreign Exchange, which is the manager of all of this. Officially, China still has over $3 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. And if you were to believe macroeconomists, they think there is actually uh, another $3 trillion parked in the Chinese state banking system. So it's actually even more than that. So they have an incredible amount of liquidity. Uh, however, uh, as things go bad at home, the economy slows down, it is normal and natural for an average Chinese citizen to question the wisdom of their government uh, doling out these big loans in low and middle income countries, but also investing in high income countries uh, when obviously they need support at home. And so I think that's a tension that the Chinese system will have to grapple with. Uh, the other concern that might come about later on is if the scale of this debt collection effort keeps ballooning. It will balloon. I think the expected expectation is that 75% of these repayments of $1 trillion will be due by 2030. If those loans start to go bad in a really big way and the money is not coming back, because uh, the Chinese financial uh, system, the banking system, might also come under stress. But uh, I mean, I'm not a macroeconomist, so I won't comment too much on it, but that's how I see the connection between what's happening in China domestically and what's happening abroad. For the time being though, their strategy is pretty much to keep uh, bailing out these projects by having the right hand give more loans to manage the loans that the left hand had given and our countries are having trouble reaping. And that brings us to this whole um, idea of sustainability of such practices, right? Um, but it, it's been an hour. Um, we've only really touched on the surface of this topic, but um, the time has, has come for us to go our separate ways. I want to thank uh, you all for joining us today, and I want to thank Omar Malik, Meredith Potter, and Yuki Shikata for joining us. Nori in particular, you're in Tokyo. It's very late. Thank you so much for staying up. Um, I hope we'll get to see you um, at another Wilson Center event. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.